Good morning. I am glad you're able to take a moment to devote to worship. Uh, I don't have any announcements today, uh, so we'll jump right in with the reading. We're looking at Matthew 5. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. On January, January 22nd of 2012, I was driving from Milan to Bavir for the baptism of our firstborn, Sophia. As we were approaching Kirksville, I called my friend Rich uh, to get a sense of what his ETA was. Rich is someone I met when I moved to Missouri, to Northeast Missouri, to serve churches in this area. And he had helped, asked me to help him run a, a church camp up over at uh, Camp Jeoda. And, and so I got to know him there. And then we started working together on just things that were, came up over time. And so he had taught me uh, over the years, he has taught me a lot of the basics of working with youth, uh, how to focus what I say in the pulpit such that it is less of a lecture and more of a sermon. Uh, he has taught me about the importance of visual design. Uh, it's just... Uh, he's been a good friend. When Sophia was born, Rich was there. Uh, he made a point to drive up to Kirksville, and uh, as is often the case when people, uh, when you have a big day, a big moment, you don't remember what they say, but you remember who's there, and, and when uh, Rich was there. And, and so we asked Rich to be uh, one of the two godparents to Sophia, and he had agreed. So on that day, as we were driving to the baptism, I called to see what Rich's timeline was. And when I asked when he expected to roll in, there was that terrible moment of silence that you get sometimes when the other person knows that the answer they're going to give you is not the answer that you want. And Rich told me that he wasn't going to be there. He thought we had talked about it, and we hadn't. It was a shock, right? It was a bit of a burden. It, it, it burdened the day and made it far harder than we had expected it to be, to have the, the godparent not be fair. Last week, we started talking about forgiveness and how that, would, that one way we can imagine forgiveness, understand it, is it's the putting down of burdens that are put on us when someone sins against us, right? And so the way that if it's like someone cuts in line in front of us, they have a, put a burden on us. They, we are now not going to check out as fast as we could have. Or, or if someone like uh, cuts us off on the highway, we have to slam on our brakes. Like that's put a burden on us. That, that, and we, we start talking about how these burdens, we can imagine them being like rocks that we are handed. And when someone cuts me off on traffic, that's a rock. And it's a small burden, but they can add up. And over time, if I hold on to all of these, that they can burden my day. And by the time I get home, I will be in a rather foul and unfortunate mood. And so we talked about the way you put these rocks down, these burdens upon us as we remember that we aren't perfect either. We assume the best of others. We pray for them, right? But this, today we move on to when the burden placed on us is far larger. It's not something small, just going to be a few minutes late to work. It's going to be something far larger. Like, for example, one of your best friends, a fellow pastor who understands the sacred nature of baptism, whiffing on showing up to be a godparent, right? More like this. This is what I'm imagining, right? What do we do with such burdens that are, there are such large rocks that they can't just be ignored, right? The things that if, if we carried them, they would weigh down a relationship to the point of breaking them. Like if I tried to carry this around with me all the time, it, it, would, it would not be good, right? This is the, the type of burden if I, if, I, if I hold on to this burden I have with Rich, I, we would not be friends today, right? It, it would just fracture the relationship. So, let's talk about what we do. 
The first part of handling such sins, such problems when they arise, can often be the hardest, though it is the simplest to explain. Don't make it worse. Right? We read in James, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. That is very easy to read. It is very hard to put into practice. For we all have our own ways of responding in moments of pain and of shock. Right? We each know how we handle those moments. Some of us shut down and just D disconnect. Some of us cry, react emotionally, and some of us lash out and get defensive and attack the other person. It is this last one that needs to be resisted most fervently. If someone hurts me and my inclination is, inclination is to immediately hurt them back, it, it just makes working it out down the road that much harder. And, and so it's entirely irrational to say, yet very hard to, to act on, there's no way to practice for it. It's just something we need to commit to. And, and, and when, the hit, when something happens, just practice. Like when I'm, and just do it. Like right? when I am hurt, not to make it worse, not to, if I'm hurt, not to immediately hurt someone else back, right? To be slow to anger. That's like the first moment, but, but the, the real work comes afterwards. Once, once the, it happens, once the moment has passed, we have some rather specific advice that Jesus offers us. Jesus has guidance for both the person who has offended and for the person who has been offended. We find it in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. These are the two chapters that I turn to that I remind myself of often when I am at odds with people, Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. Taking them in the order in which Jesus uh, talks about the two, we'll start with Matthew 5. Matthew 5 talks about realizing that you have sinned against someone. And the guidance is, if you are on your way to worship, stop. If you realize that you have offended someone, if you have hurt someone, stop on your way to worship and go to that person and get right with them. And then go to worship. Go and offer the forgiveness that you are seeking to receive from God and worship in the first place, right? So Jesus gives this advice, and he is giving it as he is speaking to Jewish folk who understand that worship is what makes them who they are, the people of God. There is nothing more important to them than worship, and Jesus says, interrupt even that. If you're on your way to do the most important thing you can possibly do, there is something even more important. Go and get right with someone if you realize that you have hurt them. And there's a, to stop on your way to worship in this context, it's, it's more than just stopping as you're driving to church, right? In, in the Jewish context, they're going to the temple, and the temple's in Jerusalem, so if they're like three days away, and, and you realize that you're, you're in the middle of this three-day journey and you're, you realize you've offended someone, go back three days. That's the, sort of what this would take. And so this is a, a, a directive, guidance, that is almost hyperbole in how exaggerated, like how, how much it's asking of someone. It makes it very clear how important this is to Jesus. No matter what it takes, stop, go to the person you may have offended, and get right with them. And I would offer as a suggestion this, this question. Here's the question. I've used it many times. Go to someone and ask, do I owe you an apology? All right? Just ask, do I owe you an apology? And then listen. And if they say yes, apologize. I'm sorry. Can I do anything to make it better? I'm sorry. Can I do anything to make it right? and then do it, right? So that's Jesus's guidance for those who realize they've offended someone or may have offended someone. Jesus has guidance for those who are hurt as well. What Jesus says, it's in Matthew 18, is if you are hurt, go to the person who hurt you and try to work it out. And if it doesn't work, go get help. Get someone that you both trust. And if that doesn't work, bring it before a group 
he go bring it before the synagogue, or in our context, it'd be the church or the personnel committee, whoever it is, right? If I'm the one who's offended, right? Uh, bring it before people at church and, and get the help you need so you can work this out. Now, this might seem a bit counterintuitive. If I'm the person who has been hurt, why do I have to take the first step to making it better? Like, I'm already the one who's been burdened. I'm already the one who's been offended. I'm already the one carrying this really large rock that I don't want to pick up again because my day's already been messed up and messed up by this badly. Why am I having to be the one to take the first step? Well, let me respond to this very valid question by asking, how often... Have each of us hurt someone without realizing it? All right, to answer my own question, there are many times I know that I have hurt others without realizing it. I highly value, I am deeply thankful for people who are willing to tell me when I owe them an apology, when I've done wrong, because sometimes I just don't know. I don't realize it, right? So to choose to seek out the person who has hurt or offended us is to express a, a commitment of, to that we value this relationship enough that we're going to take the first step. We're going to do what we can to make this better, right? And so to seek out the other person, explain, here's the problem, and ask, can we work this out? Now, in either situation, Matthew 5, I'm the one who's offended, or Matthew 18, I, I'm the one who has been offended, there is some, some, guy, some suggestions that I would offer. First, say I and not you. When talking about this, right, I can always say, like, I was hurt, I was confused, I was not expecting that. And I've said, I'm speaking for myself. And, and no one can challenge me on that. Like, I was hurt. No one can say, no, you weren't. No, I was hurt. That's what it is, right? And that ends up being far less confrontational than you are a jerk, you don't make sense, and you don't care. Them's be fighting words. That's not going to help, right? So I speak for myself. I, uh, and I often, when I, I need to go into a, a dis discussion where I know it's going to be hot, hard and hot, I will write down exactly what I need to say to make sure I have it in my head ahead of time, right? Because I, I know that when I get hot, I, we all handle our anger differently. I know that I, I need to practice to make sure I'm ready to speak wisely. Right? So first, say I, not you. And second, it is worth taking the time to rebuild what has been damaged. Even if I sit down with, down with someone, if I've hurt them or they've hurt me, and we say, you know, I forgive you, and, and I, okay, apology accepted, there's still a harm that's been done. And that's the moment where to rebuild the relationship means doing something together, right? Whether it's a cup of coffee, meal, round of golf, whatever it is that the two of you do anyways, it's time to do that thing, to start rebuilding uh, what has been hurt, what has been the problem, right? Now, we don't want to do this. Like, just talking about this, I'm not exactly excited about any of this, like going and having these hard conversations. It, it's not comfortable, it's rather awkward, but what happens when we don't take responsibility for doing this is that either we talk about it or we don't, right? If we talk about how we've been hurt with others, this is called it turns into gossip, right? And so then we start building up, like it, one, one large rock ends up be, be, being sort of built up because now I'm going to talk smack about this person to other people. You know, that person really hurt me, that person really hurt me, that person really hurt me. And, and what we're doing is we're putting burdens on them and, and one large rock starts to turn into a wall that divides us. Or, or so we either talk about it or we don't talk about it. And that one large rock seems to just like grow as it sort of like becomes more a, of a weight because we, we have to keep track of how angry we are at someone until we get bitter enough and, and, and we either just stay bitter or we lash out, right? To take responsibility to handle when we have been hurt or when we have been the one who has caused hurt is essential to being church. It's essential to following Jesus because... Otherwise, it just fractures community, and it gets worse and worse. Now, that does bring up the role of us as the church. What do we do as the church, right? When there are two people who have hurt each other, what, what is my role? I can't take responsibility for your relationship. 
I have my own things to deal with, right? I can, I keep up with myself. I don't, I can't save you. I can only work on my own relationships, right? I can't swoop in and save everyone. And this can be a challenge because if two people are at odds and I know both of them or I love both of them, especially if it's family, right? That's, who that gets hard. We hear another person complaining, maybe even ranting, and, and we're tempted to do one of two things. If, if someone is ranting about how they've been hurt or offended, we either don't say anything, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then it, we're sort of implicitly condoning what has happened. Or we, we start agreeing with them and we're sort of like piling on, and, and then we're sort of taking sides. And that doesn't help because that's adding more to it and building up the wall between people. The best we can do, in my understanding, is point people back to what Jesus tells us to do. If someone is telling me that they're having a hard time with a person, the best advice I can give anyone is, that's hard. Can I help you figure out how you can go talk to the other person about it? Right? Say things like, you know, you know that I love you both. I look forward to the two of you working it out. The most conflict-averse thing we could say and probably the one we're most likely to say because of it, we can look at someone who's complaining about another and say, I'll be praying for the both of you, for the both of you to get that worked out. What is, what's the weather going to be like this weekend? And just change the topic, right? Establish, like, we're, as a church, as a family, we're going to work this out. I'm praying for you to work it out, and I'm just, I'm just not going to feed into this hashing and ranting. Like, I, I love you both. Let's talk about something else. All right. The point being, we cannot, solve, we cannot solve each other's conflicts. We can help each other remember that when we, remember when we are struggling, that we are people who forgive and work out problems, and, and that's something that we do need to help each other do. Like I know, I have had to be reminded of that at, at times. So you know what, Andy? This you got to go work this out with that person. I, I know, and I do know, but sometimes I, I need to be reminded. So, I was working through this sermon, and I needed to figure out how do I talk about forgiveness in a very practical way, and, and so I, I needed to call someone who knew all the problems that I have been through. I needed to call someone who knew, who knew my stories, who knew the challenges that I have faced, and, and so I called Rich. <laughs> I called him, and we chatted about some of the other challenges I have faced and how I grappled with them and how forgiveness works. And we talked about this moment where he didn't show up. And the funny thing about it was we both agreed that it was a big deal. We both agreed that it was a large burden that made a day that should have been simple and joyous into something that was a lot more complicated. We both agreed that we did what Jesus told us to do. We went to each other, we hashed it out, he apologized. I know it was a sincere apology because I know Rich. And one of the few details I do remember is at the time is that it didn't feel like the apology was enough. And I think that's the nature of apologies in general. When you're hurting, an apology will never feel like enough, no matter how sincere it is. And that, that's kind of the extent of what I remember. As I was talking to Rich about it, we both remember the facts of it. That Rich wasn't there, it was a big de de it was a really big deal. He apologized, I forgave him and, and put the burden down and put the rock down and didn't continue to hold on to it. And the details have faded, and I think a large part of why the details have faded is that I have stayed at his house countless times since then. I go to his house uh, for annual conference, the, the multiple day meeting in Springfield, Missouri, that, that I go to on behalf of, of the churches I serve. I go and I stay at his house. It, it saves hotel money and that's nice. But what it really is, is a great chance for me to hang out with Rich and to stay up late and we play games and we have friends over and I cook meals for them and we go out to eat together. And it is, I was scheduled to preach for him this summer until 2020, right? It, it was the details have faded because what was once, at that one moment, the most important thing about Rich, that he didn't show up, has now become something rather small because since then, for nine years, Rich is the person, one of the people I trust most, 
one of the people I call first whenever I do have a challenge. In Hebrews, the relationship between God and God's people is described in this way, that this is the relationship, the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days. I will put my law in their minds. I will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall not teach one another and say to one another, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Remember their sins no more. I think that is what Rich and I have experienced. And we chatted about this, right? It is not that we have forgotten what happened. It's just that it's not something that we really remember. What could have been the defining moment, the event that fractured our relationship, now is just something that is in the past because we have forgiven, we have rebuilt, and now there is so much more that is good that we remember. We remember all the meals that we have shared, the, uh, that particularly amusing trivial pursuit game. The, I mean, there's just so much good that we remember since then. As I said last week, forgiveness and reconciliation transforms tragedies into miracles. This is true not just of the small things, the way that forgiveness and letting go of these small rocks transforms what could burden us down and, and allows us to lead a miraculously graceful lives. This is also true of the larger things. Like this. Forgiveness transforms tragedies into miracles, for forgiveness opens the door for friendships to continue, for families to say exactly that, family. Thanks be to God who makes this possible. Amen. There is a hymn, number 390, that describes forgiveness. And we're not going to sing it this Sunday because it is a particularly uh, odd piece of music, but the words themselves are, are the prayer that I want to make sure we pray together this Sunday. Let us pray. Forgive our sins as we forgive. You taught us, Lord, to pray, but you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. How can your pardon reach and bless the unforgiving heart? that broods on wrongs and will not let old bitterness depart. In blazing light your cross reveals the truth we dimly knew. What trivial debts are owed to us, how great our debt to you. Lord, cleanse the depths within our souls and bid resentment cease. Then, bound to all in bonds of love, our lives will spread your peace. Heavenly Father, we pray this as we pray for our communities. We pray for the schools as they continue to handle these challenging decisions that they make. We pray for uh, Tom, who is in the hospital grappling with, with COVID. We pray for all the people who are grappling with this disease and serving and caring for, for such folks. We pray for our communities that we might be able to continue to be bound together serving and caring and loving our neighbors. We pray for all these things. As we pray these things in your name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.